Hello, I'm Daniel Whiting and I'm a Professor of Philosophy at the University of Southampton and I want to talk to you today about some issues in philosophy of mind and in particular I want to look at the history of philosophy and look at a dispute between Descartes and Princess Elizabeth of Bohemia. Princess Elizabeth was objecting to Descartes' substance dualism so if we're going to understand the dispute we first have to understand that particular view. What is substance dualism? Well, there are two terms here, substance and dualism. Let's take them in turn. Descartes writes, By substance we can conceive nothing else than a thing which exists in such a way as to stand in need of nothing beyond itself in order to exist. What he's saying here is that substances are things that don't depend for their existence on anything else. They have an independent existence. In that sense, they provide the fundamental building blocks of reality out of, everything, out of which everything else is made. To give an example, think about this apple and think about its particular shade of red. That particular shade of red depends for its existence on the apple because if we take away the apple, we take away the colour. But the reverse does not seem to be the case. We could take away the colour and the apple might remain. In due course the apple might turn brown, so the colour has gone, but the apple will not have gone. So colours depend on the objects that have them, but the objects that have the colours don't depend on the colours in turn. Now what that tells us is that colours are not substances because they don't have an independent existence. What then are substances? Well that brings us to the second term, dualism. Dual, meaning two of course. Descartes thinks that there are two fundamentally different kinds of substance in the universe. Material substance and thinking substance. Let's take them in turn. Material substance, or just matter, is, according to Descartes, essentially extended. It has a length and a breadth and a depth. It takes up a certain amount of space. And there are passages in Descartes where he invites us to think of all of materiality all of matter as one big substance out of which every particular thing is made. So we might think of material substance as like a lump of modelling clay which could be configured into a vehicle like a car, a creature like a snail and indeed into our own bodies. So according to Descartes our own bodies are particular arrangements or configurations of matter or material stuff. Our limbs and organs and what have you are all just material things arranged in a certain way. What about thinking substance? Well the clue there is in the name. Descartes writes that a thinking substance is one whose whole essence or nature consists only in thinking. According to Descartes his own mind is such a thinking substance and your mind is a thinking substance and my mind is a thinking substance. Thinking here is an umbrella term for all of the things that might happen in your mind. It includes reasoning, wondering, hoping, feeling, desiring, intending and so on. So the picture to emerge is this. Reality fundamentally consists of two different kinds of stuff or substance. Matter or material substance on the one hand out of which particular material things or bodies are created like rocks and trees and then on the other hand there's thinking substances or minds. Now we might wonder why Descartes held such a view and indeed he offers a number of distinct arguments for it and I'm not going to go through them all today or any of them in any detail because I want to focus on his dispute with Elizabeth of Bohemia and she was not primarily concerned with the arguments that Descartes offers in support of dualism. Nevertheless to get a grip on his view let's look at one of the arguments he offers in support of it. Descartes writes, There is a great difference between the mind and body, inasmuch as the body is by its very nature divisible, while the mind is utterly indivisible. It's easy to illustrate what that means with an example. Think about this cake. If you take a cake, you can divide it up into portions. You can take a single cake and split it up into 12 portions. And more generally Descartes thinks you can take any material thing and divide it up into parts 
and each of those parts will itself be a material thing that you could further divide. Minds, he wants to say, are not like that. You can't take a mind and divide it up into portions. You couldn't take my mind and break it up into smaller bits, and certainly those bits would not themselves be smaller minds. And it's easy to appreciate this if we think about the process in reverse. This cake is itself made out of three other cakes which were layered together, and more generally where you have material things or bodies, you can combine them into larger material things or larger bodies. But again, it doesn't look like we can do that with minds. We can't take a bunch of minds and combine them or bring them together to form a larger mind. What Descartes takes all of this to show is that minds and bodies fundamentally differ in their natures, and so he takes that to suggest that they are different substances. Now we might question Descartes' claims here, or ask whether they really support dualism, but for now we're going to grant them because, as I said, I want to focus on his dispute with Elizabeth of Bohemia. But before I move on, let me just summarise and take stock. Descartes' view is not just that minds and bodies are distinct. The chair that I'm sat on and the desk that I'm working at, they too are distinct, but they don't fundamentally differ in their nature. They're both material things. Descartes' claim is the stronger one, that minds and bodies are not just distinct, but distinct substances, and that they fundamentally differ in their nature. And it's that to which Elizabeth was objecting. Princess Elizabeth of Bohemia entered into a correspondence with Descartes, and she's often credited as being one of the first, if not the first person, to raise what's called the problem of interaction for substance dualism. In her own words, I beseech you, tell me how the soul of man, since it is but a thinking substance, can determine the spirits of the body to produce voluntary actions. What she's asking Descartes here to explain is how the mind could causally influence the body. To give an example, I might decide to raise my arm, and as a result of that, my arm might go up, my arm might raise. So that looks like a situation in which something happens in the mind, a decision, that causes something to happen to my body. More generally, it looks like mental events can bring about or cause changes in the, bod in the body or in the material world. Now, Elizabeth focuses on that case, but we might notice that the same thing can happen in reverse. Things that happen to the body or in the body can result in changes in the mind. If, for example, I were to bang my leg against a table, I might feel pain or decide to move the table. So there, a bodily event, a collision between my limbs and the limbs of the table, bring about mental events, the formation of certain feelings or thoughts. And Elizabeth is asking how that can be possible, or how such mind-body interaction can be possible, given Descartes' conception of the mind and his conception of bodies. So one thing she suggests in her letter is that when we think about the way two material things can causally interact, what seems to happen is that they come into contact. The surface of one comes into contact with the surface of the other and somehow imparts some of its movement to it. So think about rolling a bowling ball down the alley and hitting the pins. The ball, the surface of the ball comes into contact with the surface of the pins and somehow imparts its motion to them. But that can't be what's happening in the case of mind-body interaction according to Descartes, because for Descartes, minds don't have extension, they don't take up space, and so they don't have surfaces of a sort that could come into contact with the surface of a body. So that's Elizabeth's challenge, and here's Descartes' reply, or here's part of it. He says this, when we want to explain some difficulty by means of a notion which does not pertain to it, we cannot fail to be mistaken. Now that's a very suggestive and kind of murky comment, but what Descartes is trying to say here is that we get, we fail to understand how minds can causally influence bodies because we're working with a conception of causation which doesn't apply to 
the ways in which minds cause bodies to move. And in particular, we're working with a conception of causation that applies to the ways bodily events occur and interact, the ways in which bodies interact with one another, and trying to understand mind-body interaction on the basis of it. And that's the source of our misunderstanding, he suggests. To try to clarify what I have in mind here, think about this example. Suppose, as I often do, that I'm thinking about Italian food, but my culinary experience is very limited. So when I think about Italian food, I think only of pasta. And then my friend tells me that they had some Italian last night, and they tell me that they didn't eat it with cutlery, and that they ate it in triangular shapes. They cut it up into triangular shapes. Well, given my conception of Italian food, this is very puzzling. How can someone eat Italian food as I think of it without cutlery? Or how could they divide their Italian food up into triangular shapes? And of course, this is a very superficial puzzlement, and it's resolved simply by realizing that Italian food comes in different varieties. Alongside pasta, there is, for example, pizza. And once I realize this, it's no longer puzzling to me how Italian food could be divided into triangular pieces or how it could be eaten without cutlery. To bring this back to the issue at hand, what Descartes is trying to say here is that we have to recognize that there are just different kinds of causation. There's the kind of causation that bodily things are involved in, the kind we see when we see a bowling ball knock over pins, but it's a mistake to think that all causation is like that. And in particular, it's a mistake to think that the ways in which minds affect bodies has to be like that. Minds affect bodies in a very different way to the ways in which bodies affect other bodies. And once we recognize that there are different sorts of causation, the puzzlement will go away. You might wonder how persuaded Elizabeth was by this. Well, as you might guess, the answer is not very. In her reply to Descartes, she writes, it would be easier for me to concede matter and extension to the soul than to concede the capacity to move a body and to be moved by it to an immaterial thing. So this is a very strong claim. What she's saying is that given substance dualism, it's just a mystery how minds and bodies could causally interact. And since they clearly do causally interact, we should give up substance dualism and think of the soul or the mind as something that is itself material or extended. Her underlying concern, I think, is that as Descartes conceived of them, minds and bodies are just too different in their natures for it to be possible for the one to causally influence the other. Minds are essentially thinking things, and they can't impart any of their thought to material things because material things are incapable of thinking. But material things are made up of matter and they have parts, but they can't transfer any of their parts or materials to minds because minds are not extended things. They don't have parts and they're not made of matter. So ultimately, Elizabeth thinks that substance dualism just makes a mystery of mind-body interaction. So before wrapping up, I just want to return, or I just want to turn to one further observation that Elizabeth makes in relation to Descartes' philosophy, one that doesn't always get so much attention. In her original letter to Descartes, she says this, I ask you for a more precise definition of the soul than the one you give. That is to say, of its substance separate from its action, that is from thought. What Elizabeth is saying is that when Descartes tells us what the mind is like, he only tells us what the mind does, it thinks. He characterizes the mind in terms of its actions. The action of the mind is to think. Another way we might put that is to say that Descartes characterizes the mind in terms of its capacities or powers. Minds are things that have the capacity for thought. But what Elizabeth wants is a characterization or account of the mind that tells us in virtue of what it has those capacities, what the mind is like such that it is capable of thought, such that it is capable of doing the things that it does. Here's an, an analogy that might help. Here's some coal. Now, coal burns. That's one of its actions, if you like. 
it has the capacity to burn. Now while that's true, there is a deeper story to be told about coal. There's something about the nature of coal, its underlying makeup, that explains its capacity to burn. Now I'm not an expert on these things, but very roughly it has to do with the fact that coal is made up of carbon. Going back to the mind, what Elizabeth is saying is that what we want to know is what is it about the nature of the mind? What is it about the way in which the mind is constituted that allows it to think, that gives it the power of thought? And she thinks that a satisfactory account of the mind will have to give us, tell us that. It will have to tell us about the fundamental nature of the mind that allows it to have the powers that it does. And she, her complaint is that Descartes does not offer us that. Okay, so I'm going to finish there. I hope that was interesting and I hope it gave you a sense of the dispute between Descartes and Princess Elizabeth. I'll just end by briefly noting that following Descartes, partly in response to some of the problems that we've just been discussing, a number of his contemporaries and a number of the, his successors gave up substance dualism. So in Britain, Margaret Cavendish, in Germany, Leibniz, in the Netherlands, Spinoza, all of these philosophers rejected substance dualism. And we might ask if they thereby avoid the problem of interaction. Because they're not dualists, you might think the problem of interaction simply goes away. Well, it turns out, as you might expect, that things are not so simple, but that is the story for another occasion. So I'll end it there. Thanks for your time.